You're watching The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the God. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, sir. Miss Susie Orman. Hey. Good morning, Miss Orman. And it is, isn't it? Sir? How are you? You know what? I'm pretty great. Uh, women and money. Women. Uh, you're money. encouraging women to take control of their finances. My wife already has control over mine. Why are women better than money? Better with money than men. I never said women were better with money than men. Okay. Right. It's every, the truth of the matter is everybody stinks when it comes to money. Uh, if you ask me, nobody has a grip on it and, and really an understanding of it. So, but when it comes to women, mm -hmm. women are very different than men. Women will give all their money away. Now, you said that. You said women like to co-sign for their kids. They do. They women like will do anything for their kids. But what's, what's, what's wrong with that? It's, it's your kids. I'll tell you what's wrong with it. When all of a sudden a woman goes, she's 20, 30, 40, 50, and then all of you leave her, and now <laughs> she is at 50 years of age all by herself, she doesn't have a pot to pee in. Mm. Right? And then she's like, why the hell did I do that? And then where does she turn and what does she do? So it's really, really important. And I have to tell you, especially in the black community, mm. a woman makes the money, and then all of a sudden you're going to find mommy needs it, her sister needs it, her brother needs it, and all of a sudden she doesn't have any. But I thought that's, that's what's supposed to happen. Mom sacrifices so you can have a better education, and then when you finally make it, you make sure mom is good. It's an mom, investment. It's yeah, investment mom, right. yes, but not aunt, uncle, little sister, little brother, and everybody else. Correct. Mm. All right, so it's just that... This is a time for women in particular, if you ask me, where they're finally finding their voice. They're finally being able to say all the horrific things that have happened to them all these years that they had to do. And why did they have to do those things? Because they had to get a job. Mm. Why did they have to get a job or a part or a promotion? Is they had to feed their families. So now that women have finally found a voice to talk about what's gone on in their lives, now it's time for them to find their financial So voice. what is the biggest mistakes that women make when it comes to finances? Is they give, they say yes out of fear of what other people will think of them versus no out of love for themselves. So they don't put themselves first. And that, in my opinion, is one of the biggest mistakes. They make sure that their kids are going to go to college and be paid for it, even though they don't have a penny to their name. They don't have a will. They don't have a trust. They don't have their own account set up for themselves. And they don't they don't take care of themselves financially. They really don't, you guys. I, I agree with you, but is, is, isn't it hard to do that when you're a mother? Because mothers are so nurturing and they do have unconditional love for so many other people. Yeah, that, so that's... It's hard to be selfish. It's hard. It's their nature yeah. is to nurture. <laughs> but if you want to raise a really strong little girl and you want to be a strong woman yourself, there's nothing wrong with making sure that you're okay. Because what happens, listen, I do a lot of work with abused women mm -hmm. who, who find themselves on the streets all by themselves, everything, and it doesn't have to happen that way. So all I'm saying is this is the year. This is the year where if women take their power not where they're what I'm talking inner power mm -hmm. and they're willing to put themselves first and save an eight month emergency fund, get out of credit card debt, make sure they have a credit card in their own name, make sure that they're putting money in their retirement account, make sure that they're involved in your finances with you so that if anything happens to you, she knows what to do. If she feels good with her money, your life's going to be a lot better. I'm telling you about that. But yeah, you know my what? wife handles all that. She says we for everything. And I appreciate that. Yeah, and it's something then on the reverse side, if something happens to her, do you know where all the money is? Do you know where everything is? How she pays the bills? Do you know all that? No. All right, no. So, all right, so See, now mom, we're... I think both, about that we, all we, the time. I don't. I really don't. We both <laughs> make sure if anything goes wrong, she can do it or I can do it or even my daughter can do it. But, you know, I was going to ask you, because I, I, I'm i really into money, so I, I, I follow and I read a lot of things that you do. Now, you know, we're raised, especially in our community, is to provide for our daughters and sons so we keep them off the pole. Like, you know, for instance, you know, 
I'm making sure my daughter is the triple pole, Miss Arnold. No, I knew what he meant. <laughs> and, and reality show TV, by right, the way. Yeah, yes. I, I knew. Yeah. So we were called. Wait, let's get it straight. So, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Hey, oh, so right. you know, right. you know the right. pole. Right. I'm from right from that neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I, not so much a stripper pole, but we used to take it to smash people with. But anyway, go on. Wow. <laughs> All right, but you know, so we work hard so our daughters stay off the stripper poles, so we make sure they can just focus on college. And I see a lot of times kids who can't afford it do other things for money so they can. So you're telling moms, don't worry about your daughter. They're going to grow up and be good. Mm. What I'm telling moms is this. If you have the money to take care of your kids, great. Take care of your kids. Mm -hmm. What if you don't have the money to take care of your kids? What if you don't have the money to send them to college? What if you are barely paying your bills right now? Mm. The problem is then they take out these loans to send the kids to college. And sometimes after college, they don't know what to do with their money. Now, mom's responsible for all those loans. Mom can't pay those loans. Mm -hmm. Student loans are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. So now they're stuck with them for the rest of their lives and they've ruined their lives. Got you. I will forever be grateful to my parents for poverty. I will be grateful that when the south side of Chicago changed, right, it was a Jewish little neighborhood, and then way back when black family moved in, everybody left. We didn't have the money to leave. We had to stay. Fabulous. Because mm -hmm. that's where I learned my education. That's where I learned to re be a real human being. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it gave me fight. It gave me fight to make it on my own and to be able to not have to be supported by my mom or my dad. And not that I didn't get into trouble, because I did get into trouble, mm -hmm. but I got out of trouble too. Yeah. And now I'm Susie Orman because of that. Not because my mom took care of me and my dad took care of me. I was already out of the house at 13. I couldn't even take care of themselves. Mm. And, and that's why I'm me. So it's not always, let's make it easy for the kids. Let's make sure they're okay. You do what you can do, but you got to be able to afford to do it, or you got to be honest with them. Yeah, that fire refined you. Because yeah. you, you started off as a waitress, right? I was a waitress until I was 30 years of age. Wow. 30? Yeah. Wow. So what made you change? What made you start getting into investing? So what happened, I was a waitress from 23 all the way to, you know, until I was 30, making mm -hmm. $400 a month. And then I got this brilliant idea. I could have my own restaurant. But my mom and dad, they didn't have any money. And the people who I'd been waiting on for seven years knew I wanted my own restaurant. And they all gathered together and they gave me $50,000. You must have really? been the nicest waitress in the history of life. I, I slept with every thing. one of them. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but I mean, it was 2000 from this one, 1000 from this one. These people didn't have a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. And what happened is they told me to go down to Merrill Lynch and put it in an account at Merrill Lynch. Mm -hmm. And I did. And I got this stockbroker and he says to me, how would you like to make a quick hundred dollars, you know, a week? And I go, that's more than I make as a waitress. He said, sign here. To make a long story short, in three months, all $50,000 was lost. Because right. he was playing the options market with this money <laughs> that was that's supposed not a good story. <laughs> to keep. No, but it was a great story. Mm -hmm. Right. God had his hand in what you see in front of you right now. I Absolutely. can tell you that much. Right. So I thought, I know I can be a broker. They just make you broker. So I went in to get it. I thought I can do this because how am I going to pay these people back? Mm -hmm. So I went in and interviewed for a job. And I was told women belong barefoot and pregnant mm. by a man by the name of Peter Sansevero, who was the manager at the time. He's still alive? I thought, no. Oh, damn. <laughs> right. I know, I right? I wanted him to feel that one. Oh, no, he's been <laughs> feeling it for many. Oh, you know how many times I've told this story? I know, I know, oh, I know, I've been know. sticking it to him so many times, I can't <laughs> even tell you. So I asked him how much he would pay me to make me pregnant. He told me $1,500 a month, which was like, great. And he said, listen, I'll hire you, Susie, but I'm going to fire you in six months. Why? Because he had to fill his, uh, his women's quota because there were no women stockbrokers at the Oakland office of Merrill wow. Lynch at that time. Wow. So I said, oh, well, that's $9,000 in my head. That's take me two years to make the Buttercup. I can always go back. That's where I was a waitress at the Buttercup Bakery. So I took the job. And again, to make a long story short, you know, I realized as I was studying to be a stockbroker that what he did, my broker was illegal. Mm. And so somebody advised me and gave me the name of a lawyer. And I sued Merrill Lynch while I was working for them because I knew they were going to fire me anyway. And how much did you get? Well, I'll tell you. But because they because I sued them, they couldn't fire me. Who knew? 
I didn't know that. <laughs> No, absolutely. They couldn't fire you. Listen, man, you got to do what you got to do. You had to game the system. Know. Wow. I didn't know. So so by the time it came to, to the court, I was their number six producing broker. Peter went on to become regional manager, all right, fine. And um, and the new manager gave me all the money back plus 18% interest, which then I was able to pay all the people back. Wow. Right, But that's how I started. And I learned what goes on in these brokerage firms. And I learned how most of them, not all, especially some financial advisors, they don't care about you. They care about their own Mercedes. They care about their own jewelry. They care about Absolutely. their own house. So that's when I started on a mission to empower everybody, you know, not just women. All of you need to be empowered. It's, you know, right now, this is the year of a woman, and this is a reprint of a book that I did, you know, in 1987. Mm -hmm. But it's time that those women who didn't read the first one when it first came out, they need to read it now. It's a new generation. Quick question. Did you dance when Peter died? Um, I didn't know he had died. Mm. And I'm not even really sure, you know, he died. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I hope sometimes my words have an effect on him. Okay. Um, it's, but I would never be happy, you know, when God chooses to take you. It's it's he's rejoicing, not me. Yeah. Now, for women who are listening now, what? How do you suggest that they start? Because everybody wants an answer. You know, everybody wants a quick fix. What would you suggest somebody who is saving that might have a little money? What would you suggest they do with their money? So there's an order to money. Mm -hmm. You first, if you have debt, you're never going to have financial freedom if you have debt. So get yourself out of credit card debt. Then save an eight-month emergency fund. After you've saved an eight-month emergency fund, because if you lose your job, if something goes wrong, you got to feel okay about it when you have a little money. That's when you can, if you're doing something that you don't want to be doing, you can leave also. Right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're trapped. You're trapped in a bad relationship. You're trapped in a bad job. So after you do that, now we have to make a decision. If you're working for a company that has a retirement account, like mm -hmm. a 401k, start, especially if they are matching your contribution where you put in a dollar and they give you 50 cents, I don't care if you don't have a penny to your name you've got to sign up because that's free money mm -hmm. make sure it's a roth 401k or if you don't have a 401k at work your own retirement account you should have a roth ira start saving for a down payment on a home if you are parents you have got to have a will a living revocable trust an advanced directive and a durable power attorney for health care your children cannot if they're minors cannot inherit money do you know That's that? Mm -hmm. yeah. So you leave your kids, you made all this money, and you leave it to them, and they're under 18, it's going to go in a blocked account. But, doesn't I, it, but can't they get it when they're 18, though? Yeah, but what happened? Who's going to take care of them from the time they're three, oh, four, got you, got you. five? Absolutely. Who's going to take care of them? So they need a court order to get that money before 18, not the kids, but who's ever taking care of them. So there's, you have to have your paperwork in place. Mm -hmm. You have to know how do you take title to a house. You need to have the right kind of insurance. If you have whole life universal or variable life insurance, you're all being ripped off. Right? You should only have term life insurance. You need to know what type of investments to invest in. In the Women and Money book, there is a financial empowerment plan that takes you step by step. Do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that, do this, so that you can sit in your power one day. I was going to ask you, you know, uh, how does somebody with your bank account relate to the average everyday person? But I get it now. You was broke for so long. So long. And, you know, everybody will still tell you that they really believe that I think I'm still a waitress, but serving up a platter of financial advice versus food. Wow. When you've lived the life that I've lived, you don't take that out of you. You just... You just can't. Hustle's well, the, beauty, the beauty of being the waitress you are now, I don't got to tip you because you got plenty. Yeah, I, I, I do. I got, yeah. I got lots. I got more than I'll ever need, which is why, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but for three years, I'm 67 right now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And three years ago, I decided, who am I? I need to know who I am without all these standing ovations and the cameras and everything. Mm -hmm. So for three years, I stopped doing all this and I went and I lived on a private island mm. and learned how to fish Okay. And everything. And then I start watching the Me Too movement. And I'm like, this isn't just about women being violated. This is about women needing to really be strong so that they can say no because they have enough money. And they don't ever have to say yes because they, they need to suck up to some man who might give them a job. I, I, I read that about you. You said that your thoughts, feelings, words, and actions need to be one, one. yeah that's why, that's why you decided to go away for a little while yeah it's um 
You know, I've watched too many people in this industry as they get older, they can't stop. Mm. And they can't stop because in my belief, what would they do and who are they? Mm. So it happens to your life when you stop and you can't work or you lose your voice or you get in an accident. Are you still happy just doing nothing with nothing around you? And I found out I was really happy doing that. And I'm still really happy doing that. Mm -hmm. But but you got multi-millions of dollars too, though. Yeah. That makes it really cool to do nothing on a private island. It makes it really cool <laughs> to do nothing. However, now that I know, but the, here's what's so cool about having millions of dollars on a private island. It can't buy you nothing. Mm. Yeah, but there's nothing there. There's no stores there. Mm. There's nothing there to buy. There's nothing there to spend your money on. You So all the money in the world, you can have it sitting there and it's not going to do you any good. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn really, you know, I now know how to fillet fish and catch fish mm -hmm. and feed myself and go down and dive for lobsters and get stone crab out of rocks mm. and all these things. Well, can money buy happiness? No, but lack of money sure will make you miserable, right? What buys happiness, not what buys happiness, but when money is great is when you have power over the money that you have. If you think money defines you, but if, and it, it's what makes you great, you'll be the saddest, loneliest person in the world. But when you have money and you have power over that money, and you can also use that money to do really great things in this world, really great things yeah. in this world for people who will never have money and people who really have just been dealt for whatever reason, a really hard blow, mm -hmm. then money's a really fabulous thing. 100%. Are, are you still spending 300000 to a half a million on flying private? Yes, at least. When's the last time you flew commercial? <laughs> uh, I flew commercial just about, I want to say, two or three months ago. Why? What happened? What ha well, I wasn't, I had to pay for it. No, um, <laughs> I, you know, no, it was, it was just, it didn't make sense. It was, we went over to Spain and when I fly overseas international to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars or a hundred, 200,000 for a one way trip is crazy. So you but spend that a year, half a million? At least. Okay. Yeah. Because I fly here, I fly home. I fly to this talk. I fly to that talk. I, and all those flights, it's, it, you know, it number one keeps me healthy and I can afford it. There you go. <laughs> you own your own jet or do you charter? <laughs> no, I charter. I would never own my own jet. Mm -hmm. Ever, ever, ever. Why not? Because I'll tell you, the first time I ever flew private mm -hmm. was December 4th, 1996. This year he, he flew private for the first time this year? Twice. Yeah, you got to fly commercial again? He didn't pay it, though. He didn't, I didn't, he pay, didn't pay, for pay for it, though. He yeah, but it, see, though. it gets you kind of spoiled yeah, there. I, I, it does yeah, for a little bit, but then yeah. you smack but I, out of But I like JetBlue Mint, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what happens is I fly little planes. I don't fly the big Gulf streams. I fly little ones. Mm -hmm. But anyway, and there was a man by the name of Cy Newhouse who was worth about $9 billion. He mm -hmm. owned Random House. He owned Condé Nast. He owned whatever. And he took a liking to me. We were at a conference. He said, why don't you fly home with me? I'm like, okay, all right. And I'd only flown coach by then. Right? And I'm like, I'm on this private plane. And he looked at me and he said, huge plane. He said, Susie Orman, I know one day you're going to be a wealthy woman. And I said, from your lips to God's ear, sir. And he said, listen to me, only charter planes. Never buy a plane, never buy a plane, never buy a plane. He said, I can afford to buy a lot of planes. I'm telling you, never do it. And I figured since that was my introduction to private flights, it was years later, obviously, until I was able to charter on my own. I thought, I'm going to follow his advice. I do what the rich people do. But when you look up how much you've already <laughs> spent on chartering, do you say to yourself, oh, I could have just bought a plane already? No, because a plane will cost you maintenance, maintenance yeah. on a plane, gas on a plane, crew on a plane, insurance on a plane. You have to fly at least 150 hours a year to make purchasing a plane. I've done the numbers <sighs> every which way. <laughs> and because and, <clears throat> your ego always wants you. Right. you know, it's your ego. I want to say I own a plane. I don't own a plane. I'm glad I don't own a plane. As an example of the American dream, you, you once said in another book that the American dream is dead. You still believe that? I said that with a book called The Money Class. And this was in 2007, 2008, when mm -hmm. the markets absolutely crashed. And the American dream, the way that we saw it, growing up, having a house, two cars, and this, on some level for many people, I think is dead. Mm. I do. I think a lot of people now, and this isn't the people that the administration talks about or that anybody recognizes, I think that they can barely make it through. 
they don't have any money. They're barely paying their bills. They're barely able to feed their kids. They're never going to be able to retire in their minds. They're never going to own a home that, you know, a lot of them will never even own a car. And their new dream, when you talk to them, is just to be able to make it through every day. Mm. So, but they're surviving. Tr- surviving. Yeah. And, and middle America, many people are just surviving. They're just, and they're not thriving. They're not, you know, there, there was a highway in to poverty and there's not even a sidewalk out. Mm. And if you ask me, which is why I'm on this mission, the government's not going to be able to save us anymore. They can barely save themselves. Mm-hmm. We're at a time where women, minorities, anybody, unless in my opinion, you're a white man is being ignored. That's a fact. And not cared for. So we got to start talking to ourselves and helping ourselves and holding ourselves up because the time is running out. I know the markets are good. I know real estate right now is good. It's not going to be that way for much longer. Mm -mm. That we're $21 trillion in debt. Eventually, it's going to catch you. Just like your own credit card catches you that when it's maxed out, now you don't know where to go. Now you got trouble. Mm -hmm. Eventually, our credit card for the United States debt is going to run out out and the people who are going to suffer aren't the rich it's going to be this program's going to be cut medicare is going to be cut social security is going to be extended everything that we rely on is going to go away Mm -hmm. so women out there men out there you got to start taking care of yourselves right here and right now you don't have a moment to lose you know it's it's i've been saying that for years but a lot of people always say you know it takes money to make money so I love to hear these stories of somebody who was a waitress and just made it happen. Can you talk to people about relationships and money and, and how relationships sometimes are really bad because of money and why men lie in relationships about money, why women lie in relationships about money? Everybody lies about money in a relationship. One out of two couples that get married end up in divorce. And the number one reason for divorce is arguments over money. Mm-hmm. What's so interesting about money is that none of us talk about it, but we all show it. We all show it with the chain you have on, the watch you have on, the jacket I have on. We show all this wealth to people. We're showing money every second of every day, whether we have it or not. When you say people don't talk about it, what do you mean? People don't. Every... You need to listen to the city girls. Uh, Yeah, yeah, the city girls may talk about it and things like that. (laughs) But when I'm saying what they talk about money, but they don't talk about they have $30,000 of debt. Mm, True indeed. Yeah, they talk talk about what they buy and what they have and they show it. And... Everybody balling. Right? Yeah, yeah. But nobody's talking about, yeah, but I don't have anything in savings. Mm -hmm. And I have $30,000 in credit card debt and I haven't really started a retirement account yet. And the truth of the matter is I haven't paid my student loan in six months. Mm. I don't talk about that. And that's the real picture. Right. So what happens in relationships is because nobody wants to talk about it. Everybody ends up arguing. So you have to, I have a saying that you have to FICO first, then sex. And what a lot I, of people don't what? know what FICO means. You know <laughs> so that. what that means by that is every one of us has what's known as a FICO score or a credit score, mm-hmm. which is a three-digit number that determines the interest rates that you will pay on your homes, your mortgages, your credit cards, everything. Car, all that. Right? Yep. The higher your FICO score, the lower your interest rate. The lower your FICO score, the higher your interest rate. And what happens is you get involved, you meet somebody. You love each other. Mm-hmm. Before you get fall into lust with this person, because the bed has just been so fabulous, and then you go la-la land, you need to know about this person as much financially speaking as you do personally speaking. Damn right. You need to know, do they have credit card debt? Are they in student loan? What's the real picture there? Because their picture is going to paint you into it very shortly. Mm-hmm. That's what Tiffany Haddish always says. She was like, I want to know your credit score. All right. All right. Yes. That's what you need. Yeah. Okay? And tell me about it. And if the person that you're talking about doesn't want to go there with you, goodbye. Because I'd be like, I'll show you my credit reports. I'll show you my FICO <laughs> score. I'll even show you my damn bank accounts. <laughs> because you have to understand those are things are you. Right. That's you. Your money is a physical manifestation of who you are. So what's, more you important, what's more important, credit or uh, uh, blood work? 
Um, I have to tell you, I think credit. Oh, my goodness. Right? <laughs> goodness gracious. And let me tell you why. So if they got little herpes. That's right. that little it's herpes, cool. okay, they got 800 credits. Cool. Yeah, it's like you got hands and other things that you can satisfy everything with. All right, you can go all there. <laughs> it's like, but once, but once you are financially, uh-uh, then you can be ruined. It takes a lot longer to cover from a few sores than it does from financial <laughs> bankruptcy. Funny, okay. Yeah, funny, Susie. Now, now, when it comes to credit, women out there dating, what credit score should they be looking for for a man? So 720 they, or above. 720 hey, or above. Hey, I'm, I'm married. The, Sorry, I'm off the, you know. Yeah. Under yeah. okay. 720, don't date them. It, it, I'd like to know the reason why it's less. Mm -hmm. Tell me why. Did you get sick? Did you not? Were you not able to pay your medical bills? Just talk to me about it. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a logical reason. Oh, I was married and my spouse left and took me to the cleaners. Just tell me about it. Mm. But if there's no good logical reason and you're seeing they have a lot of shoes in their closet, either way, right? And they're they're doing things that just don't make sense. Gotcha. Yeah, be very careful. Now, when did you get married? I got married in 2010. I've been with KT for 18 years. Why so late in life? Was it because you were focused on business or... No, because I always, first of all, I'm gay, right? And so I wasn't able to get married legally okay. until later on, right? But Duh. but um, I always ended up with <laughs> women that were just fine. It's so lo such losers, mm. not even funny. And I always find it fascinating because powerful women can tend to end up with the, a partner that's not so powerful. Mm. I mean, y'all, you won in a million. I yeah. mean, and so, and it's, and it took me till I was 50, till I met KT, who is equally, I'm telling you, that woman is a, she's listening right now, right? It's like, that woman is so powerful, it's not even funny. Mm -hmm. And she was also so successful when I met her. So it was a great match. Gotcha. And it's a, it's fabulous. KT is fabulous. That shout out's going to get your bath drawn, lady. And your I know, up. right? You said bath drawn. All right. <laughs> now, you recently said don't retire or claim Social Security until you turn 70. Yeah. But Fool.com said that your Social Security advice isn't ideal for everyone. So what are the pros and cons of, of that? So the, the, what's happening now, which is why Stanford and many other institutions are saying, I think Susie Orman may be right here. Mm -hmm. We're all living longer, you know, and and our money has to last us. So if you retire, that means you start drawing down on your assets now. Mm. You start taking money out of your retirement accounts. You start your Social Security earlier rather than later. And Social Security from the time of 66 till 70 grows 8% a year. That's a great return on your money. Mm -hmm. So in my belief, given when you don't have any money and you're really struggling, you got to work as long as you possibly can. And if you can just wait till you're 70, assuming you're in good health and everything's okay that way, mm -hmm. you're going to get more bang for your buck. You right. just are. And so I just think you should wait because mm. then your retirement account grows. Everything grows. You're making money. As soon as you stop working, you start drawing down all your assets. And if you live longer, you're going to wish you never did that. Now, now you also say self, uh, what is it? Self-worth equals e net worth. Yeah. Talk about that. It's like a glass of water, mm -hmm. all right? You have a glass of water here, and if water has, the glass has holes poked in it, and you, you know, pour it in there, the water's all going to come out. Absolutely. You have holes in your being. Holes from this person hurt you. You lost money on this. This person lied to you. This boyfriend of girlfriend. You have holes. So if you don't have self-worth, if you don't know who you are and you don't value yourself, money's going to come in and it is going to flow out. Mm -hmm. It's going to flow right out of you. You are not going to be able to hold on to that which you have created. And you can see that always happening with women. You know, women that get in really, I do a lot of work with the domestic abuse hotline with women who are now survivors of domestic relationships mm -hmm. and they had no self-worth. That was the one quality that was missing, that was missing. They didn't even recognize that they were being abused. Mm. How do you not recognize you're being abused? You don't recognize you're being abused when you have no value of who you are. Yeah, abuse me. You should be abusing me. The book, Women and Money, isn't just a book about do this and do that and do that with your money. No, 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 no. It's about 
Don't put yourself on sale. Don't undervalue who you are. Say your name. The eight qualities of a wealthy woman. You have to know who you are before you create what you deserve to have. Do you think self-worth uh, like goes up and down in value? Oh, self-worth always goes up and down in value. Because yeah, you always got to do those checks on how much you're worth. In always. Way. It's, you know, things happen that always attack you. But I have a saying, for me anyway, that the elephant keeps walking as the dogs keep barking. Mm. When you become successful, every, yeah, everybody wants you to be successful till you're successful. That's a fact. Then once you're successful, everybody wants to tear you down. They want to tear down a performance. They want to tear down what you said. They want to criticize you here. They want to find a bad thing to say about you. So you got to just keep walking. Mm. And your self-worth has to be strong enough that when everybody's trying to attack you, because they want to be you, and the only way they can be you is they rip you. Mm. And you have to be strong enough to take those attacks. you just got to be strong enough. And when you're strong enough and you get who you are, man, what a life. Mm. Then what? Now you're living a wealthy life. Wow! There you have. I got you some water. Now I got a couple yeah. more questions. Oh, just a couple more. That's now, a great way to close. I feel good. I got a couple man. more. Got a couple more. Now, uh, no shame, no blame. Yeah. In, in that chapter, you say in order to build a healthy relationship with money, there's some attitudes you have to cast off forever. What are some of those attitudes? Yeah, you can't listen if you've blown your life. Who hasn't blown their life? Every one of us has blown our lives. Don't blame yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't be ashamed of who you are. Who cares if you don't have money? Then God looks down and says, you're not going to get to come to heaven because you don't got any money because you got debt. No. And so you, you, you can't walk around. Fear, shame, and anger are the three internal obstacles to wealth. Mm. Fear that you're afraid to tell people the truth or you're just afraid of everything. You're ashamed of what you have or you're really angry at somebody because of what they did to you. Mm -hmm. You're never a victim to your circumstances. You have got to become a, vic a victor. And so get rid of your shame. Don't blame yourself. Get rid of all that. Don't look behind you. Look in front of you. Because there's always really a golden door for you to walk through if you just keep walking. Now, can you tell us about your 25 times rule? My, yeah, so my 25 times rule was very simple. If you're afraid, right, you have a fear, write down what your greatest fear may happen to be. And then you need to create a new truth. So if your fear is you're never going to have enough money, your new truth would be I have more money than I ever need. Make mm -hmm. it present tense and make it unlimited. You need to write that new truth down 25 times a day. You need to say that new truth out loud. Scream it 25 times a day. And you need to look in the mirror and say it silently to yourself 25 times before you go to bed. Every time you think you can't, you have to say you can. Every time somebody says you're never going to make it, you have to tell yourself you can. You have to be your own best friend and your own advocate. But to do that, you have to get the grooves in your head going with the beat mm. of your life. I do that with my kids every day. Right. But my, my, kids my final day. question, are you still cool with Oprah? Are you still friends? Oh, my God, I love Oprah. In fact, on this Saturday night, we're doing, it's sold out already, a thing at the Apollo called mm. Women and Money, and the Oprah Winfrey Network is taping it wow. October 1st at 8 p.m. It will air on her network. Listen, I've met many, many people in this world. Mm -hmm. There are very few as great as Miss Oprah Winfrey. Few? Only one. <laughs> yeah, there's only one. Well, you know, there was Maya Angelou. There oh, were, yeah, true. There true were indeed. some extraordinary, there, there are, and Oprah would tell you that, I think, herself. Right? But, whoa. Look, I even get goosebumps when I think about it. Wow. Y'all still buy each other presents? No. Nah, nah, did no, we right? ever buy each other presents? Oh, I don't know. I would what do you buy Oprah? And what do you buy Susan? That's what I'm saying. Like, did y'all ever, like, oh, one Christmas, time century, birthdays? Uh, no. I, I always figure everybody's sending Oprah all this stuff. It's all junk anyway, so who cares about it? So, but I send her emails and True. I tell her how I think about her. And I uh, tell her I miss her. Well, tell her we love her too. Right. I and think we love she'll you too, Susie. Thank you. And, yes. and we won't take emails if you want to send us some. We, you know, we'll do. Yeah, I'll take any gift. You I send got news. Out. I saw that video of that whoever that was throwing all that money around. Oh, that, that that you see, we were picking it up. Right. I was like, if I had known that, I would have showed him how to really do it. He just did dollar bills. I would have brought in hundreds. Hey, Ooh, step that, your game up, so far. So far, I don't got it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, Susie Orman, we appreciate you for joining us. We were talking outside that they, you said you got into a, a, a argument. Yeah. And the spat was. Exactly. She said fight. Yeah, she said fight. fight. It was fight, fight with Master So P. here we are years and years and years ago now, I want to say maybe even 15 years ago, 
Russell Simmons had a Get Your Money Right tour. Mm-hmm. And I traveled all around. I was the only white girl in this whole rapper thing because it was, M- well, it was Eminem. Mm-hmm. It was Master P. It was Little John. It was Reverend Ron. It was all Commons. Okay. It was all of us, all right? Mm-hmm. And all There's these, only one common. Common. One, just one common. common. Like, <laughs> whatever his name is. Common. Common. Right. Right. And, but so we're sitting there, and the whole audience was in Detroit. Everybody's there really not to hear about money. But they're there to give them their little samples of their CDs and them rapping, mm. right? So that they could become like them, right? And so I'm up there talking to these kids about how if you save a hundred dollars a month, you know, and you do so for, and I give this a whole example how they can become a millionaire. And also, Master P says, "Where are these kids going to get a hundred dollars? These kids are never going to have a hundred dollars." And we got in a fight over it. It's like. Don't because your thoughts create your destiny. Absolutely. So I'm like, don't tell me what were they doing with their money when they were giving you money to sell them something, Master P. Right? It was like he's just looking at me, and we went at each other. And you know, I hope somewhere, if somebody's listening to this, they have it on tape because I'm sure it was fabulous. <laughs> and at the and then I didn't ever see him again except I'm now doing the Wendy Williams show, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden they say Master P's in the room next to you, and I'm like. Oh, God, really? And so I knocked on the door. I said, remember me? And he kind of just looked at me. I'm you not sure if he did. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know if you were the feds or not. Yeah, I did, right? yeah. so, but that, so that's what happened. But I took him on straight up. It's yes. not hard to save $100 a month, though, because I'm sure if you look around in that audience, you saw all kind of expensive sneakers Jordans. and expensive clothes. That's what I Beats think. Uh, but, you know, and the example, and the example was a great one. You start at 25, saving $100 a month, and you do so every single month until you are 65 and put it in a good Standard & Poor's 500 index fund, let's say in a Roth IRA with average market returns, you'd have a million dollars. But if you wait just 10 years, $100 a month is $1,200 a year. For 10 years, it's $12,000. Not that much money if you wait 10 years. And you start at 35, at 65, you'd have only $300,000. So those 10 years cost you $700,000 at $100 a month. And now he's arguing with me. Don't argue with Susie Orman, Master P. You're not money, P. You're Master P. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Susie Allman. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. Thank you.